The reading today is Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of the God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So be it. bow with prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you that you are so faithful, that you are so good, that all the wonderful things that you do for us, the blessings that come from you, Father, that we deserve darkness and death, but instead you've given us light and peace and hope through Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to not only look homeward up to heaven, but to fix our eyes on Jesus, to, to that to be our field of view, to be like Christ, to please Him, to, to listen to His words, to His commandments, Lord. To know that He is counting on us to follow in His footsteps, to, take up, to deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow after Him. Lord, it is part of Your great and wondrous plan. We just thank You and praise You that You are so faithful and true that Your covenants will not be broken and that we can count on that. Help us to firmly build on the foundation that is Jesus Christ. And then, Lord, let us live a life that brings you glory and honor as we draw others to the throne room. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you weren't here last week, we went over Hebrews chapter 11. In Hebrews chapter 11, we spend so much time looking at the heroes and heroines, but we didn't spend much time doing that. I just wanted to tie it together as the author writes this letter because it's one continuous letter to the church. And if you remember, this is a letter to the church, the Hebrews, those that are Jews that follow after the faith of Abraham and who have realized that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He is the chosen one of God. And they've given up their, who they think they are because of being children of Abraham to, to live by faith in Jesus Christ. And the author ties pretty much together all of the Old Testament. And what his vision here in this le letter is, is so that you will fixate your eyes on Jesus and nothing else. That heaven came down and glory filled my soul. That I was a sinner, I was blind, now I see. That Jesus became flesh and blood, the words of life. He brought light to mankind so that you could shine your light before men. That you're not saved, just saved, but you're saved to live a life for the kingdom of heaven. That when we pray, we say, not our will be done, but God's will be done. Our Father who is in heaven. That we cry out to Him as a personal Father. We, we cry out, Abba, through the Spirit. That the, that the veil is torn. We have direct access to the throne room of God. And we have at our disposal everything that God offers us. So are we living like this? Because the problem is, and the problem is in the Hebrew church, and the problem is still today, is many that say they believe don't really believe. Many that say that they believe then wander astray or live a life of unworth because they get distracted, they get weighed down, they get entangled with sin. And so since we've seen this great cloud of witnesses, how are we going to live? I started out Hebrews by saying that Jesus should be coming bigger and bigger closer and closer, more and more for you, that He is everything in your life, that you live for Him, that you truly can live out the great commandment that you'll have no other gods before Him, that you'll love the Lord your God with all your mind, soul, body, strength, and that you'll love others as you love yourself. And if you look at that chapter of Hebrews 11, you'll see that they did things because of their faith. They live by faith. Faith is not just a belief, it's a way of life. As you look back in Acts, you'll read that the Christians followed a way. They were, they were known as those who followed the way. 
the way that Jesus Christ set out before them, the way that he lived. They lived different than the world around them because they weren't looking at this world. They were looking at their heavenly home. And even if you look at your heavenly home, you can be distracted if you don't fixate on Jesus and what he's done for you. That you were doomed, that darkness had encompassed you, but then there was light. Just as we, were, we thought about the cross and the darkness that came before Jesus' death, that if it wasn't because of Jesus' death, we'd be trapped in that eternal darkness. But instead, because Jesus laid down His life, it is finished for those who believe that put their faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus paid the debt once and for all that you could live. And now the difference between you and the, and the Old Testament heroes and heroines is that God comes and dwells in you. The Holy Spirit dwells in you, empowers you, and teaches and reveals you everything that Jesus said and did. Who Jesus is, and He is God. Jesus said it is better that He goes away, that the Holy Spirit comes, because He will be our comforter, our strength, our advocate. He will do so many things for us. And back in Hebrews chapter 1, when I did the first um, sermon on the Hebrews... I read from Psalm 95 because it was quoted. Psalm 95 reads this way. It's a song about true worship and our response of worshiping. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before Him with thanksgiving and extol Him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In His hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to Him. The sea is His, for He made it, and His hands form the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, the flock under His care. Today, if only you would hear His voice. Do not harden your hearts as you did in Meribah, as you did that day at Massa in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested me, they tried me, though they had seen what I did. For forty years I was angry with that generation. I said, they are the people whose hearts go astray, and they have not known my ways. So I declared in an oath, they shall never enter my rest. The author of Hebrews, whoever he is, is writing so that the, the believers in the Hebrew church don't fall short. That they don't think that one day they'll see Jesus face to face and He'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. They never ever believe that they'll hear the words, depart from me, I did not know you. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth for many who think that they're okay. That they're in a right relationship with God. They will never enter my rest. Because God doesn't want a watered down faith. He doesn't want your sacrifices. He doesn't want your coming together and your, your meaningless praise songs. He wants you to worship and adore Him for what He has done for you through Jesus Christ. Do you see that? Does it encompass you? Do you fix your eyes on Jesus so that you live in such a pattern? Without what Jesus Christ did for you, you would spend an eternity apart from God. That's forever. There's no coming back. There's never, no second chances. And if you go back and study Jesus' words, and you read some of Matthew, <laughs> so you saw more of Jesus' words, whether you're supposed to or not, and it doesn't take that long to read 1 Thessalonians, but after the sermon, I'm going to be glad to read it to you, Chuck, if you'll hang around. No. <laughs> It'll take you about... 30 minutes at max to catch up two weeks worth. Do you understand that? But yet we say, I'm not pointing any fingers, we say so many times, I don't have time to read this chapter today. I've got things to do. And instead of just reading it, we just, if we read it, we read right through, we go through the motions, but we don't concentrate on what that is and meditate on God's words and pray what that means for, for me and my life today. And if God is sovereign, then He had you reading that chapter today if you chose to. But it's your choice. So as I read that chapter of Hebrews 11, I think about what the author's writing, and I think about what Jesus has done, and I think about Him being our perfect high priest, and Him laying down His life, and everything else. 
and I think about how I am responding to that. And I look at this chapter of heroes and heroines. And instead of concentrating on just them and their failures and successes, I look at the pattern of what God is doing in this redemptive plan called salvation through Jesus Christ. That I believe in Him and I live a life that shows what I've believed. Am I a hero of faith? It's what the author is trying to get me to know that I am because I am a hero of faith. And you are a hero or a heroine, heroine of faith if, in fact, you believe. You may not do mighty things. You may not part, be a part of parting the Red Sea. Or you might not be a part of, of a lion being in a lion's den and him not devouring you. But you have a part to play. You are exactly where God puts you, exactly the people around you, so that you can proclaim this faith that you have or not. There's no greater thing that you can do but proclaim what God has done for you if, in fact, you believe. So when I look at this chapter, I went back and I looked and I said, well, this is about heroes and heroines. So I looked up the definition of hero, and then I looked up, let's let's look at it from a flip side of the coin because sometimes that helps. What is the opposite of hero? And I took these words from word hippo. The opposite of hero is nemesis. Supervillain, adversary, foe, rival, arch enemy, enemy, opponent, malefactor, loser, born loser, defeated person, disappointment. So I've got to think, if I'm not living a life of the hero that I'm supposed to be for my faith in whatever circumstance I'm in, whatever that is, declaring God's glory, proclaiming what Jesus Christ has done for me, living a holy set-apart life... Again, I may not be moving mountains. I may not be on a mountaintop. I may be in a valley low. But am I living by faith? Because if I'm not living by faith, am I a nemesis to God? Am I His foe? The scripture that, that uh, was in something early, I don't know if you read it, Debbie, or what it was, is we, why we were enemies, Christ died for us. That's who I used to be. So now I'm called to be a hero for God. Sometimes it doesn't look like it. Satan's always going to whisper in my ear that I'm not, that I can't do this or that, that I don't have the ability to do it, that my sins are greater than that, that whatever the excuse is, that I don't have the time. They're all excuses. They're all to trap me down and to keep me from living a life heroically like I was called to live and empowered by God and His Spirit to live. All of those people that are listed in Hebrews chapter 11, and we saw faith over and over again, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. They believed and they did whatever that was. So by faith, I've got to do whatever it is that God calls me to do. Not poor, poor, pitiful myself or be distracted or be entangled in sin or anything else. I've got to live a life of faith. So when this devastation hits me, and I don't know what these things are in your life, whatever this is, I've got to say that, I can overcome this. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Because I'm not supposed to sit here in the valley low. I may be in the valley low for a long time because that's where God wants me. Because like even when Paul was in prison, he witnessed to the prisoners and to the guards. And they sang hymns in prison because that's exactly where God wanted him. And he wrote these letters that we have. Probably not Hebrews. We don't know who the author of Hebrews is. Because they lived by faith in the positions that they were in. And they were commended by God for doing that. They received a commendation. They were awarded. Okay, so what is the opposite of commended? Disallowed. Disapproved. Discouraged. Canceled. Vetoed. Criticized. Badly obscured. So if I don't live a life of faith... I'm not heroic in my faith. Am I a villain who is disapproved by God instead of being commended by God? So what's the opposite of faith? (laughs) Let's get to the point. Because either I live a life by faith or I don't live a life by faith. So does that mean I live a life of disbelief, non-confidence, unfaithfulness, unsureness, indecision, inhibition, unbelief, dubiousness, and indifference? 
I mean, we like to say everything's gray. This is okay. That's okay. You do your own thing. That's especially the motto in this world today. But Jesus said, My sheep follow my voice, and they will not follow the voice of another. And if you love me, you will love even your enemies. And you will love God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, all of your strength. And you will deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow after me. For whoever chooses to be my disciple and looks back longingly does not deserve the kingdom of heaven. Will you live a life of faith? Or will you let the things of this world, the things you see, instead of fixing your eyes on the unseen and especially fixating them on Jesus, will you let the things of this world discourage you or entice you and entangle you, make you live a life of indifference? You were bought with a price, the blood of God's one and only Son, to be redeemed out of this world so that God's kingdom would come and His will be done. You can be satisfied with daily bread. You can forgive others as God forgives you because the power lives inside of you. Don't reject it. I gave you some words to think about on Easter and what the opposites of those were. Doubt, well, the opposite is belief. Fear, the opposite is peace. Despair, the opposite is hope. Loss, the opposite is gain. Death, the opposite is light. And darkness as we contemplate the darkness that we were in until the light came to us and revealed the glory of God so that we could shine and reflect Jesus' light. Just like there is no light from the moon whatsoever. And sometimes you see a full moon and sometimes you don't see a moon, a new moon. The light of the moon is a reflection of the sun. If the sun wasn't there, you would never know a moon existed. Are you reflecting the light of Jesus Christ in this world? Yes, sometimes you won't shine fully. I understand that. We're all sinners. Why did Paul say, why do I continue to do the things that I do not choose to do, that I don't want to do? I chose them. That's the wrong words. I don't want to do them, but yet I still do them. In chapter 11, then, we define what faith was. That it is the confidence in what we cannot see, that we're spiritual beings that we understand that because in John chapter 4, Jesus said the time is coming when we will worship in spirit and truth. That I am one because God's spirit dwells with me, so my spirit dwells with God and I have fellowship with Him and I have fellowship with others. It's that complete confidence, trust, nothing can break. I am firmly grounded in it. We also learn in verse 6 that it is impossible to please God if we don't have faith. And we don't know, not just that He exists and that Jesus died for our sins, but that we earnestly seek Him because we know that He will reward those who do. So faith alone, as James says, without works is dead. And we're given many examples of greats of the Old Testament and some kind of obscure examples of the Old Testament, men and women. And we see how they gave up, suffered, were confused, and maybe wandered about, whatever it was, but they still lived by faith. And they did not know the name Jesus. You and I do. So every time I think that, I think, I should be living so much more by faith. Doesn't mean I'm going to live a life that's any greater or be any more well-known or that people will say anything about me when I'm said and gone. And I don't care if they do. What I care is they say, he told me about Jesus. We're given all of these examples. They lived and they died. But they lived by faith and they were counted as commended to God for their righteousness. They are great examples of heroes and heroines. But verse 39 and 40 tells us that God wasn't finished with their story because He's writing their story along with our story because it's the redemptive plan of God to save a sinful man. You're writing along with their story if, in fact, you walk by faith. So are you living that way? 
Would God consider you commended? Would they look back at you later if they remember your name? If they don't, who cares as long as you proclaim Jesus. But if they remembered your name, would they call you a hero or a heroine of faith? Would you inspire them? Even though we see your sins and failures, look at David. But yet he cried out with his sin with Bathsheba and said, and Uriah, we won't forget him, but he said, Lord, against you and only you have I sinned because the, his heart was convicted that he sinned against God. Our sin has consequences to other people, but our sin breaks our relationship with God. And without Jesus Christ, it would be forever broken. So if you believe, how can you not live a life of faith? Oh, is it because sin has easily entangled you? Is it because you have idols that you didn't realize you have that deceive you? Is it just because you're complacent and tired? I told you before, in fact, you should be living a life more of faith. You should be running. You see where the author is going? We didn't mention this anywhere in Hebrews chapter 11. In Hebrews chapter 12, he compares it to the Greek games. We're familiar with that. They, they, we are somewhat, but they totally were. It was what the day was for. The gods and goddesses, the emperor declared his glory, and people came in and, and showed their homage to him, the kings and kingdoms of this world. And they did it in these, these games, competing for their country. But you don't belong to this country. You belong to your heavenly home. So you should compete and run for the kingdom of heaven, for God and His glory. Are you running for what Jesus has laid out for you? Hebrews 12, chapter 1. Thank you for reading it, Polly. Therefore, let's tie all this together. The conjunctions there in the original Greek. Everything that the author's told you about so far and all these examples he's laid out before you, he says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so in easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Fixing your eyes on Jesus, the pioneer or author and perfecter of our faith, <clears throat> For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. I was going to go ahead and preach on Hebrews chapter 12 today, but I couldn't get past three verses. Since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses... And don't get that mistaken. Just because he ties it to the gather of the games doesn't mean that the stands are full of these heroes and heroines shouting you on, watching from heaven. That's not his point. You can see that from Scripture if you read it. Not his point at all. These examples were examples to show you how they lived a life of suffering, of wandering, like I said, whatever it is. And they're waiting on you to do the same to bring to completion God's perfect plan. It's not that they're watching you. The world is the one watching you. The kings and kingdoms of this world are watching you because you are a witness, same word for martyr, for Jesus, for your testimony about Him. That's the gospel message. So since we're surrounded by such a great, great cloud of witnesses, these that were our examples of living by faith, walking by faith, then let us throw off everything that hinders in the sin that so easily entangles so that we can run. See the difference? These guys walked their life of faith so that we could run our life of faith. Because we can fixate our eyes on Jesus. They couldn't do that. Wow! God's plan for us the ability that He gives us, the Spirit living with us, the veil being torn, gives us such an opportunity that they did not even have. If they are witnessing, they're like, wow, look what you've got. But are they also looking and saying, do you not realize it? What is your story telling? 
God lives inside of you so you can proclaim His glory and the passion that He had for you when Jesus Christ laid down His life. Even Jesus submitted to the authority of God as a human being suffered and as God was separated from God. All to bring you back so you won't have to suffer God's wrath and bring you into fellowship with God. So what do we need to do since we have these examples? We need to throw off everything that hinders. Okay, that doesn't say sin. That says throw off everything that hinders. What can that be? I gave you some examples there earlier. Complacency. Things that we don't know that are idols. Oh, I can't go do this because I got this job I got to do and they won't allow me to talk about the gospel there. Or I've got this task that I've got to get finished first even though I feel like God's calling me here. Whatever it is. Examine your own hearts. I've, I'm examining mine and the sin that sin so easily entangles. Oh, now, wait a minute. Maybe some of those things that I spend so much time on, they're a good thing, and they're not really a sin, but maybe I've allowed them to become a sin because they're an idol for me. Oh, it was hard to see till I examined myself because I think of sins as these things, lying, stealing, and cheating that I shouldn't do. But yet if I place other gods before him, <laughs> I back way up on that list of commandments, don't I? I go back to the ones relating with God. And then as I think about that, I think about the ones relating with my brothers and sisters, and I think about, oh yeah, just the fact that I won't forgive that brother. Wow. I do have sins that entangle, don't I? So once we've thrown that off, the things that hinder and the things that entangle, then let us run. Think of the games again. Any athlete that ran would not run with baggage. You might train with weights, but when you run to compete in the event, you shed all of that so that it doesn't weigh you down. And you decided to run this race to compete for the glory of your homeland. You might win, you might compete. You know the thing about our competition, though, is we don't compete against each other. So that's obvious from the chapter 11. Jesus Christ won the battle. He defeated Satan on the cross. The world didn't realize that. They thought it was the craziest thing in the world that God would not come off the cross. But we know why He stayed on the cross. So that He could lay down His life for us. And so that you could run. So let us run in what? With perseverance. Because this church was turning away. Some of them were getting entangled. Some of them were being hindered. And persecution was coming after this. So the author had the spiritual enlightenment to write this to encourage them when the real torture came. Because if you're not serving God again now, and every one of us thinks it's going to get worse in this country, that our freedoms of religion are going to be persecuted, if you're not worshiping now, you probably or surely aren't going to then. Because the fear then is going to overtake you. The fear of your testimony. So what's keeping you from your testimony now while you have the opportunity without the fear to do it? Run with perseverance what? The race marked out for us. Now I'll take that individually and put me. I have a race marked out before me. I don't need to look at the other people in the race and say, well, this person does this. And I'm looking at racers, runners then, right? I'm not looking at the world. I'm saying this Christian does this, so maybe that's okay. This Christian does that. What is the race marked out for me? And how I can proclaim Jesus Christ and bring glory to God and draw others into the kingdom. Are you living that life? Would you be called a hero? Well, how do I do it? Wow! By fixing my eyes on Jesus. Something that the people from chapter 11 could not do. 
We've already got faith in this chapter, but now how do I firmly live that life of faith? How do I run a life that gives God glory and honor no matter what the circumstances? I fix my eyes on Jesus. Not just the home, but the one who granted me access to my home, who gave up heaven, lived a life without the things of this world, who did not sin, and then who willingly went to the cross to save me. I fix my eyes on him, the pioneer or the author and the perfecter of our faith. So I listen to all of his words. So maybe it was God's design and plan for us to read those chapters of Matthew. <laughs> to see Jesus' words again. To see what he did, what he taught. He gave up everything for the joy, the joy that was set before him. That was his race to run. So he did endure the cross, he scorned its shame, and then what did he do? He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. All right, so we fixed our eyes on Jesus. Now verse 3, we need to consider Jesus. And notice that verse 2 didn't say fix your eyes on the Messiah or the Christ. It gave the name Jesus, the name above all names. Consider Jesus who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Oh, I'm worried about losing my job. Jesus lost his life. I'm worried about them posting these, these things for me on Facebook about me. Jesus was beaten. He was whipped. He was not rec recognizable as a man. He was spit upon. He was mocked. And then he was crucified. All this so that he could say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. And it is finished for you. My life should be running for the faith that I proclaim. Running towards glory and the author and perfecter of it. I'll take you back to uh, a little bit further back in Hebrews again and r remind you of verses that the author wrote. These were all commended for their faith, 1139. Yet none of them had received what had been promised. Verse 40, since God had planned something better, better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect, complete. God's plan of restoration where we live with God forever and ever and ever. Oh, Father in heaven. Thy will be done. Thy kingdom come. So I've got to live my life now to bring glory and honor. So the Greek word for faith is pistis. And I'm going to quickly go through some of Jesus' involvements with that word. We saw it however many times it was in Hebrews chapter 11, 20-something, I think. In Matthew, Jesus records it, or Matthew records Jesus' words and some other words just a few times. Most of these are from Jesus. Matthew chapter 8, starting in verse 5. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came and pleaded with him. So I'm giving you some more examples from Jesus' time about living a life of faith. Lord, my servant lies at home paralyzed and in terrible agony. I will go and heal him. Uh, I will go and heal him, Jesus replied. The centurion answered, Lord, I am not worthy. Catch that. He came to Jesus. He said, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. But just say the word. I recognize that you are who you say you are, and just by your word you can heal. And my servant will be healed. Verse 9, For I myself am a man under authority. Now here we go, something different added to the story. I realize authority when I see it and I submit to it, and others realize there is authority and submit to it. Oh, and you submit to one ruler or king or the other, the king of this world or the king of kings. I am myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell one to go and he goes and another to come and he comes. I tell my servant to do something and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those following him, Truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. Faith that we proclaim, but yet we don't follow our commander-in-chief, Jesus on in verse 12, it says, the sons, But the sons of the kingdom 
will be thrown into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. They thought they were part of the kingdom of God. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go as, as you have believed, so will it be done for you. And his servant was healed at that very hour. Now if you notice that word there, what Jesus said to him, Go as you have believed. Pistis is a noun. It's faith. It means faith. Knowing, well, what is faith? Oh, that God exists. And that the only way to please Him, you know that He created all things, is not only to believe, but to act upon it and be one that goes out and seeks Him with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, all of your strength. And Jesus commended Him for His pisteo, the verb form, for what He believed. Because He believed something, He had faith, and He did something. He called out to Jesus and Jesus answered him. In Matthew chapter 9, verse uh, 1 and 2, Jesus got into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own town. Then some men brought to him a paralytic lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take courage, son, your sins are forgiven. These are other guys that have enough faith that bring this guy, and because of their faith, this guy is healed. Okay, that's kind of like the centurion too. Loving others enough that we live a life that brings them to Jesus. Do you see a pattern here? And then in Matthew chapter 9 later on in verse 18, while Jesus was saying these things, a synagogue leader came to him and knelt before him. My daughter has just died, he said. But come and place your hand on her and she will live. The man's got faith, so he came to Jesus and he asked in part for another. This happened to be his child. So Jesus got up and went with him along with his disciples. Suddenly a woman who had suffered from bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak. She said to herself, If only I touch his cloak, I will be healed. Then Jesus turned and saw her. Take courage, daughter, he said. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was cured from that very hour. Wait a minute. Now, Jesus was supposed to go see about the guy's daughter, right? And this other person came up with faith and interrupted. But that faith caused a healing. So we read from Mark, some of the same story, verse 35. While he was speaking, messengers from the house of Jairus, we learn that that's the guy's name, arrived and said, your daughter is dead. Why bother the teacher anymore? But Jesus overheard their conversation and said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just believe. See, that story is intertwined here to show the faith that this woman has to be healed so that Jairus will increase his faith so that God can even raise his daughter from the dead. In Matthew 9, verse 29, as Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him, crying out, Have mercy on us, son of David. After Jesus had entered the house, the blind men came to him. Do you believe that I am able to do this, he asked. Yes, Lord, they answered. Then he touched their eyes and said, According to your faith, will it be done to you? And their eyes were open. Do you have faith for Jesus to touch you and heal you of all of your fears, all of your doubts, to take away your idols, to strip off everything so that you can run the race that is marked out for you? In Matthew chapter 15, starting in verse 25, The woman came and knelt before him, Lord, help me. But Jesus replied, It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, Lord, she said, even dogs eat the crumbs that fall off their master's table. O woman, Jesus answered, Your faith is great. Let it be done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed at that very hour. A mother come pleading for her daughter again, and not one that was even part of the kingdom of Israel, just some goat that came and wanted to become a sheep. Matthew 17, 20 or starting in verse 17. Oh, unbelieving. That word is this epistia, means unfaithful. We got the opposite here, like we talked about. Oh, unbelieving generation and perverse generation, Jesus replied. How long must I remain with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. If you look at Matthew 13, 58, he says he didn't do many miracles there because of their unbelief. Remember that when we're reading this here. 
the miracles that could have been done in your life, the souls that could have been touched, that could have came to Jesus because that was part of your race, but you didn't want to run it. You ever think of it that way? Then Jesus rebuked the demon. It came out of the boy, and he, healed, and he was healed from that very moment. Afterwards, the disciples, Jesus was... Um, after that, the disciples asked Jesus privately, why couldn't we drive it out? Because you have so little faith. He answered, for I tell you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, that's all it takes. You can say to the mountain, move to he from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Mark gives the same account, and he says again, O oh, unbelieving generation, how long must I remain with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him, and seeing Jesus, the Spirit immediately threw the boy into convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, How long has he been with him? From childhood, he said. Something that seems impossible to be done. It often throws him into the fire or into the water, trying to kill him. That's the purpose. But if you can do anything... Have compassion on us and help us. If you can, Jesus replied, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the boy's father cried out, I do believe, help my unbelief. See, that's the problem with so many Christians and the problem with the church today. We say that we believe, but we never ask Jesus to help us with our unbelief because we're entangled with things that we think are good, but we haven't shed them off because we don't realize we're running a race. That there's a race marked out for you. No matter where you're at in that race. And you need to run in faith. Fixing your eyes, knowing that God is writing His story through you, just like He wrote through David and through Moses and through Samson and whoever those examples are. Luke tells the same story also in Luke chapter 5. The apostles said to the Lord, Increase our faith. And the Lord answered, If you have faith the size of the mustard seed, you can say to the mulberry tree, Be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. He goes on to say this, though. Which of you whose servant comes in from plowing or shepherding in the field will say to him, Come at once and sit down to eat? There's this perseverance, there's this realizing that you're a servant serving the master and that you have a job to do, that you put your hand to the plow. Instead, won't he tell him, prepare my meal and dress yourself to serve me while I eat and drink, and after that you may eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did what he was told? So you also, when you have done everything commanded of you, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. Is that how you view your faith? That you have a race marked out before you, that you need to run with perseverance, that you need to, sh to shed off everything that could keep you from running that race well? That there doesn't need to be any sins in your life that entangle you and you fixed your eyes not only on homeward bound to heaven, but you fixed them on Jesus in living like him, letting Him live through you. Could part of the problem with our faith be that we don't even realize we're running and then we haven't prepared or shed off to run? In Matthew 21, verse 18, In the morning as Jesus returned to the city, He was hungry. Seeing a fig tree by the road, He went up to it, but found nothing on it except leaves. Jesus wanted to find from that tree. Oh, that reminds me of us being grafted in and producing fruit. And he said, may you never bear fruit again. And immediately the tree withered. When the disciples saw this, they marveled and asked, how did the fig tree wither so quickly? Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only will you do what not only will you do what was done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown in the sea, it will happen. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask in prayer. Why do we doubt so much? Why do we fear? Look at all the things that Jesus has told us. Look what He did for us on the cross. And He said He's coming back. He said He will never forsake you. 
Nothing can separate you from God's love. There is nothing too great that you cannot go through in this world, for God is with you. And why do we doubt? Why do we fear? Why do we not run this race with perseverance? Run it, fixating our eyes on Jesus. The very last time the author, well, Matthew um, uses the word pistis, it's in Matthew chapter 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, the ones who thought they had it all figured out, the ones who thought they were religious. You're hypocrites. You pay your tithes of mint, dill, and cumin, but you have disregarded the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. We also know that Jesus said they were blind guides leading blind to their destruction. You can't say you have faith, as James said, and not live it. And if you have faith and you see, you, you can see this, then you're going to run this race with perseverance. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy, I can look at it a little differently now, set before him he endured the cross and scorning its shame. If I look at it as joy when I see what Jesus did for me, then I can go through this time of suffering knowing that God has a bigger plan, that my cancer might be to bring uh, the gospel message to some of the doctors there or whatever, that this problem I'm going in with in a strange relationship to whatever might be that I can bring whoever comfort and whatever it is. The Holy Spirit's called the comforter, that God comforts us so that we can comfort others. I don't know. And because I don't know, I don't need to doubt or fear. I need to walk by faith, fixing my eyes on Jesus, knowing that he's in complete control and that I should see it as joy because he's going to work out great things through me. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So I'm going to consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that I won't grow weary and won't lose heart. You know, one of the key things with running a race is if you're ever trained by anybody, you're told, don't ever look back. Because if you, lose, if you look back, you lose momentum. You start doubting yourself. You see where that person is behind you. And like I said, you're not even running a race against other people. You're running the race marked out for you to see how well you have finished it because God marked it out in front of you. But you never, ever look back because you'll lose momentum, you'll start doubting, you'll lose your focus, and you'll lose your speed. Period. It's, it's, a, it's a statistical thing. When people look back, it changes their pace. You also don't enter a race and not run, do you? That would be the stupidest thing that you could do. Yeah, I said that. Why in the world would you go and sign up for a race and not run? Everybody else would look at you and say, what an idiot. What a fool. He says he's running a race, and this race is for Jesus, but he's walking. He's sitting down doing nothing. Did you see that one over there? He just left. The world is watching you. You're supposed to be like Christ. I'll tell you a little story and I'm going to close. It's about a barnyard duck. Yeah. There was this farmer. His name was Chuck. No relation. And he had a barn and he had a duck. It's just because it rhymes. And on that farm he had cows and pigs and horses too. He had chickens and ducks, and of course, a lot of poo. Sometimes, ducks, other ducks, would fly down, and this one duck would look up and see them fly down. And he would wonder, what are those ducks? But yet he'd look around and see all the chickens and say, I'm content. I'm in the farmer's 
field in his barn, I've got everything that I need. I've got a roof over my head, hay to lay down in my bed. The farmer comes and feeds me, gives me water to drink. But then every once in a while, he hears some quacking instead of cluck, cluck. And he wonders, is he a chicken or a duck? So he looks up, and he sees the ducks flying. And they're quacking out to him, calling, freedom, freedom. But why? I've got everything that I need. There's nothing wrong with me. Oh, poor duck. So he goes about each day, doesn't realize that the farmer's giving him grain to fatten him up. One day he looks up and says, man, I think I want to fly away. But he can't because he's got too much weight. So he just says, I'm going to be content where I'm at. I've got everything made. I see other ducks. I don't understand. So I look up again. Oh, wait a minute. Am I a duck? So he decides to shed a few pounds. But he still holds on to that grain that keeps coming in each day. He decides to train a little bit. But he continues to eat that grain that Farmer Chuck feeds him. He says, oh, how I long to be a duck, but I'm afraid I'm entangled. I just can't do it. One day, <clears throat> Farmer Chuck doesn't bring his evening dinner. He brings an axe instead. There you go, Chuck. There are more, no more days for the duck. Silly, silly duck. You sat so content in all the muck. Can you imagine that day when Jesus says that to you? He says, oh, Christian, you wouldn't fly. You wouldn't run the race. You sat content in your salvation and proclaimed in your worship, but you never truly lived. And I gave you so much more than these heroes and heroines of old. I came to live with you. I became flesh and dwelt among you. You had the words of life in every translation that you could have, on every device that you could have. You had every freedom and opportunity to proclaim. But you were just content sitting in the muck. It will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, you silly, silly duck. Thank you, Lord, for sending your son to die for our sins, to pay the price so that we could be purchased back to you. Thank you for Jesus' examples. Let us hear his words and obey. Let us see that these are the words of light and life. To see that the reason that you have left us behind and not taken us home yet is because you have a perfect plan that you've incorporated with us from the heroes and heroines of old to live a life of faith. Help us to fix our eyes on Jesus and Jesus only. To not be entangled. To not let sin drag us down. But to strip off everything so that we can run out the race that you have marked out for each one of us, whatever that may be. That in the highs and the lows and the contentments and, and whatever life brings us, that we will thank you and praise you and use what you have given us to your glory and honor. That we won't complain, that we won't lack faith, but instead increase our faith. Not so that we can have more, but so that we can give up more to serve you that we can live a life that does scream out to others to be like Christ, to accept Him as Savior and Lord, to give up this world knowing that their home is in heaven. We thank you for that firm foundation which is Jesus Christ. And we pray this in His name. Amen.